Bruce Springs. Welcome to Deep Dives. Uh, this is an opportunity for you guys to be able to dive deeper into your faith. Each and every week we preach a text of scripture from the Bible and try to draw out as much as we can to encourage you in your worship of Jesus Christ. But this is also a midweek opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into what it is that we covered the previous Sunday. And so this past week we were in Genesis chapter 6 verses 5 through 17. And our main point was seeing that God flooding the earth was both judgment and salvation. It was a judgment against the corruption and wickedness of, of human beings, but also salvation because in doing so, it grieved God's heart. And so he pr provided an opportunity for Abraham and his family to be saved. Now, if you remember at the beginning of the text, there's this peculiar passage from Genesis 6 verses 1 through 4. And in that passage, it says this, when man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. They took as their, as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. So what's at stake for us here is trying to figure out first and foremost who the sons of God are and also who the daughters of man are. How we answer those questions really uh, determines how we're going to interpret this passage and even some other things that pop up later on in the Bible. Now, traditionally, there have been three different interpretations of this passage and a lot of them have uh, equal weight in terms of their support meaning that you have lots of people with big degrees high education who support all three let me lay them out for you and then try to give a case for which one i think is most compelling first is that sons of god refers to a kingly line of descendants from lamech now, if you consider the context, you remember in Genesis chapter 4, we're introduced to Lamech as kind of the great grandson of Cain. And Lamech becomes this picture of rampant wickedness that's happened because of, of Cain killing, killing Abel. And so Lamech takes for himself two wives. He becomes a vengeful kind of person, boasting about his murderous ways. Well, you'll notice that these sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took his wives any that they chose. So this first interpretation would look at it as kings who had descended from Lamech engaging in polygamous marriage, taking as many wives as they would like, much like Lamech did. And you remember Lamech had two wives and, and boasted about that. So that's one interpretation. A second interpretation, which has kind of regained some popularity, is that the sons of God refers to angels. The strength of this position is that sons of God almost exclusively refers to divine beings throughout the Old Testament. Whenever you see that phrase, it's typically referring to angels or divine counsel. And so having that idea, you have angels who've rebelled against God come down to earth and in their rebellion they've chosen to marry uh, daughters uh, daughters of men a couple of difficulties with that interpretation however uh, number one Jesus in the New Testament clear, clearly states that uh, angels neither marry nor are they given in marriage that's from the lips of Jesus in uh, the Gospel of Matthew and so this passage is clearly about marriage, right? It says in verse two that they took as wives any that they chose. And so angels coming down and uh, engaging in marriage when Jesus said that angels don't marry is peculiar. Now, again, another strength of, of support here is uh, Jude and uh, I believe it's first or second Peter chapter two uh, also refers to this angelic rebellion. Ezekiel 28 seems to allude to an angelic rebellion. But is that what's being referenced here is the question. Uh, furthermore, this interpretation would then suggest that the angels and the women, human women sleeping together, would then produce this Nephilim, which is traditionally understood as a race of giants. And so if angels and humans are having relations, somehow giants are produced. 
I think another reason why that interpretation may be a little bit difficult is uh, nowhere prior to this passage are angels mentioned and then the result of this does not include angels either as the passage goes on God brings judgment on the world because of the actions of men not because of the actions of angels well there's another thematic approach that I think has some strength to it now while linguistically sons of God typically refers to angels or the divine counsel sons of God can also and may also refer to the line of Seth here's my reasoning for that if you look at Genesis chapter 4 yet again which is part of this context Cain clearly represents this wicked line that's descended from the woman and Abel represents uh, kind of a godly line that reemerges in Seth after Abel uh, after Abel is killed and so you have these sons of God and you have these uh, daughters of Cain so to speak who continue on with a godly line and an ungodly line a believing line and an unbelieving line and so when you think of that theme and you get here to Genesis chapter 6 now what the condemnation appears to be is that you have the believing line those who follow God and have covenanted to uh, to be obedient to his ways and his statutes have now decided that they're going to engage in uh, in, in unequally yoked marriages with those who do not follow God and we know that throughout scripture that's something that's severely condemned when Solomon becomes unequally yoked it's condemned in scripture when David does it it's condemned in scripture when we do it second Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 I'm thinking of to not be unequally yoked uh, it's constantly looked down upon in scripture for uh, believers to take on marital relationships with unbelievers and so it's for that reason I believe that that's what's in view verse 5 says that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually given that it's part of the same section here uh, closing out the uh, these these generations of Cain I think it's easy to interpret that the the wickedness that part of the wickedness that's being spoken of is man has taken decision making into his own hands and decided to uh, take on wives who are not who are not believers which is wicked all in all whatever of these three interpretations that we hold to whether it be the Lamechian interpretation that these are polygamous relationships involving kings whether it be the angelic interpretation that these are angels who have rebelled against God and are sleeping with human women or the third one that this is that these are the sons of Seth the believers who are now engaged in inappropriate relationships with unbelievers the point is is that the sin of Adam has continued on that man has decided to has determined good and evil for himself and now God brings judgment as a result and so as you read through this passage um, really understanding that there's a level of wickedness here that's condemnable by God let's search our own hearts and see where it is that we're determining good and evil for ourselves as well where is it that we believe that we are the judges of what's right and what's wrong and we are deciding to hold our ideas over scripture as opposed to falling underneath them and once we've discovered that let's run to the feet of Jesus Christ and repent because the hope in this story is that there was an ark for Noah Noah was saved let me point this out really quickly the section really ends in verse 8 it's kind of the, the way the, the, the Bible's divided up, the way this the way Genesis is written. It's divided into these sections of generations. And this last line, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, that's the last line of that section. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah, and Noah was a righteous man, starts a new section. We know it very clearly because it says these are the generations of Noah. What's the point in me sharing that with you? It's that the order isn't reversed. Noah didn't find favor because he was righteous. That's a different section of the book. Rather, Noah was righteous because he had found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And so the same can be true for you and I. We can find favor in the eyes of the Lord. God is gracious and will extend his grace to us. We need only to receive it and walk in faith. And so repent of the sins as we probably have similar ones as what's being condemned here. 
recognizing that 2 Peter 3 promises us that a second judgment is coming, and the only way to escape is through the ark, and that ark is Jesus Christ who died for your sins and for mine. And so I hope this is encouraging and helpful to you. Uh, hopefully we'll be back again next week diving a little bit deeper into Genesis 9 as we look at the Noahic Covenant. Uh, but hopefully this blesses you this week. Take care.